met Larry Nassar when I was somewhere around the age of five years old. My parents had become close friends with Larry and his wife, Stephanie. They were all medical professionals and shared a passion for the subject. It was during this time, I estimate I was approximately six years old, that Larry Nassar began to sexually abuse me. I was 12 years old when I told my parents, when Larry rubbed my feet, he uses his penis. My parents confronted him and he denied any such action. Due to complex details that I won't get into here, my parents chose to believe Larry Nassar over me. Larry Nassar's actions had already caused me significant anguish, but I hurt worse as I watched my father realize what he had put me through. My father and I did our best to patch up our tattered relationship before he committed suicide in 2016. Larry Nassar wedged himself between myself and my family and used his leverage as my parents' trusted friend to pry us apart until we fractured. Perhaps you have figured it out by now, but little girls don't stay little forever. They grow into strong women that return to destroy your world. Your letter states, now Aquilina is having a four-day sentencing media circus. She wants me to sit in the witness box next to her for all four days, so the media cameras will be directed toward her. I don't need any. I don't need any cameras. You certainly are free not to take my picture. I don't have a dog in this fight, sir. I didn't orchestrate this. You did by your actions and by your plea of guilty. And you may find it harsh that you are here listening, but nothing is as harsh as what your victims endured for thousands of hours at your hands, collectively. You spent thousands of hours perpetrating criminal sexual conduct on minors, spending four or five days listening to them is significantly minor considering the hours of pleasure you've had at their expense and ruining their lives. None of this should come as a surprise to you. Judge Aquilina is seeking media attention over court protocol. Really? This is the people of the state of Michigan versus Larry Nassar, not Judge Aquilina. I'm doing my job. I try to do it well, unlike what you did. So I don't know if it's your frustration at night or what's going on here, but I have to say, this isn't worth the paper it's written on. I'm the mother of Chelsea Markham. And you're reading her statement. No, um, she couldn't be with us today, but I'm going to be telling you uh, from a victim's mother's point of view. But I first wanted to tell you that my daughter was adopted from South Korea, and I got a call from our social worker that wanted to know if we would be willing to take a baby that had some medical issues in, 19, in August of 1985, and we said yes. I sat up with this baby at night because she couldn't lay down. And the bond that came from her and I was just inseparable. We did everything together as she continued to grow up. During her normal childhood, she you know, wanted to do all the activities that all her little friends did. And we had the Saturday morning classes and the gym and the and the whatever, swim lessons. And so she really caught on to gymnastics. Well, um, that became five days a week, sometimes six. Um, and she was made, on, she went to team really quick. Um, because she was really good. I had been in the room with her during her examination, as usual, and I said, are you ready to go to lunch? And she's like, no, Mom, I just want to go home. And I said, what's wrong? Are you in pain? And she said, Mom, I just want to go home. And I said, okay. So we got in the car, and I said, and she started bawling, 
And I said, Chelsea, tell me what's wrong. And she said, Mom, he put his fingers in me, and they weren't gloved. And I said, Chelsea, I was right there in the room, and she goes, you couldn't see what was going on, Mom. And she said, he hurt me. She had the self-loathing. Um, I didn't. I had her see a psychiatrist, and it didn't seem to be helping. There was a lot of self-blame. She had quit gymnastics the following year, uh, when she was 13. She um, made bad decisions. Um, it affected her social life. Um, she started running with bad crowds. She got into drugs, and she never really recovered. And um, so, in um, 2009, she took her own life because she couldn't deal with the pain anymore. It all started with him. It just became worse as the years went by until she couldn't deal with it anymore. And as you can see, she turned into a beautiful young lady who was really, really sick. And that's my story for her. Uh, I came in today and I didn't want to be a disruption, but you guys are, you guys are uh, reinforcing my view that I am a disruption. Our process is for the victims and the survivors and not about us in Michigan State today. But again, today is about the victims, it's not about us. This is not the place for that conversation. There'll be another time and place to do that. Folks, there are, there are pieces about this story that are public and there are pieces that will be told. This is not the day to do that. This is a day for listening to the victims. Again, this is not the day to have that conversation. Uh, I've become disruptive enough and I don't want to do that again. So are you saying you won't come back? What do you say? No, what I'm saying is I'll listen, but I'm not going to be this kind of disruptive because the focus of the attention should be on the people who are telling their story and not on me or Michigan State. Well, this has been a distraction for over 20 years now, so that means yeah. absolutely nothing to us, just so you know. I appreciate that. And sure you do. And, and I hear you. I heard your story, and we'll see you hear your story. To Luana Simon. I don't even know how you are still in the position that you are in. I don't know how you can still call yourself a president because I don't anymore. You say you aren't responsible for this. I wish you would come up to this podium and be half as brave as all of us have had to be the past year and a half. You are trying to manipulate people into thinking that you are innocent when you are not. As far as I'm concerned, you are just as bad as this monster that has attempted to ruin all of us, but he hasn't and you won't either. Larry, I hope you, Luanna Simon, Kathy Clagus, and all of the USAG are scared because you have pissed off the wrong army of women. Thank you. treatments included, but were not limited to breast exams, stretching me while he would lay on top of me with his penis on my crotch, massaging me in very intimate places, and even placing his ungloved hand into my anus and vagina in order to get my hips to pop back in place and relieve my back pain. When I came forward in August 2016, I was attacked on social media. People did not believe me. Every day after that, more women and young girls were coming forward. I wasn't alone.
Dr. Nestor was not a doctor. He, in fact, was and forever shall be a child molester, a monster of a human being. End of story. The scariest night of my life happened when I was 15 years old. I had flown all day and night with the team to get to Tokyo. He'd given me a sleeping pill for the flight, and the next thing I know, I was all alone with him in his hotel room getting a, quote, treatment. I thought I was going to die that night. Our silence has given the wrong people power for too long, and it is time to take our power back. Thank you. Signed, Michaela Maroney. Who was the doctor that USAG sent to keep us healthy and help us get through? The doctor that was our abuser. The doctor that is a child molester. Nobody was even concerned whether or not we were being sexually abused. I was not protected, and neither were my teammates. Larry Nassar is accountable. USA Gymnastics is accountable. The US Olympic Committee is accountable. I am here to face you, Larry, so you can see I've regained my strength, that I'm no longer a victim, I'm a survivor. Your abuse started 30 years ago, but that's just the first reported incident we know of. If over these many years just one adult listened and had the courage and character to act, this tragedy could have been avoided. For this sport to go on, we need to demand real change, and we need to be willing to fight for it. It's clear now that if we leave it up to these organizations, history is likely to repeat itself. will send a message about how seriously abuse will be taken. So I ask, how much is a little girl worth? Victims were silenced, intimidated, repeatedly told it was medical treatment, and even forced to go back for continued sexual assault. When I came forward in 2016, I brought an entire file of evidence with me, and the MSUPD handled it beautifully. But MSU officials were a different story because the response of Dean William Strample was to send an email to Larry that day and tell him, quote, good luck, I am on your side. What we had to go through for our voices to be heard because of the responses of the adults in authority has greatly compounded the damage we suffer, and it matters. Not long after I stopped seeing Larry, I transitioned from athlete to coach, and every day that I nurtured those baby gymnasts, I wondered if any of them would find their way into his exam room. When one of my little girls was finally referred to him, I took a chance and I spoke up. And I was kindly cautioned for my own sake to remain silent. Her family moved away almost immediately thereafter. And I wept for that little girl and I prayed to God that she was under the age range that Larry preferred. She was seven. But when I filed my police report, Kyle Stevens came forward and she was six a year younger than my little girl. And I cried in my kitchen. And I don't know yet if that little girl walked out the same that she walked in. Larry, I remember the day you brought Caroline into your office so that I could hold her. You knew how much I loved children. And you used your own daughter to manipulate me. And every time I held my babies, I prayed to God you would leave your abuse in the exam room and not take it home to the little girl born with black hair just like her daddy. I have been there for young gymnasts and helped them transform from awkward little girls to graceful, beautiful, confident athletes and taken joy in their success because I wanted what was best for them. And this is a joy you have cut yourself off from forever because your desire to help was nothing more than a facade for your desire to harm. You have fashioned for yourself a prison that is far, far worse than any I could ever put you in. And I pity you for that. I plead with you to impose the maximum sentence under the plea agreement, because everything is what these survivors are worth. Thank you. Your words these past several days, your words, your words, 
have had a significant emotional effect on myself and has shaken me to my core. I also recognize that what I am feeling pales in comparison to the pain, trauma, and emotional destruction that I will make for you. There are no words that can describe the depth and breadth of how sorry I am for what has occurred. An acceptable apology. Sir, you need to stay at the microphone or they can't hear you. An acceptable apology to all of you is impossible to write and convey. I will carry your words with me for the rest of my days. I do want to read some more of your letter. And the reason I want to do that is because I've considered it in sentencing as an, extent, as an extension of your apology and whether I believe it or not. I was a good doctor because my treatments worked and those patients that are now speaking out were the same ones that praised and came back over and over and referred family and friends to see me. The media convinced them that everything I did was wrong and bad. They feel I broke their trust. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Oh. It is just a complete nightmare. The stories that are being fabricated to sensationalize this. Would you like to withdraw your plea? No, you're not. Because you are guilty, aren't you? Are you guilty, sir? I accept my plea, exactly. This letter, which comes two months after your plea, tells me that you have not yet owned what you did. That you still think that somehow you are right, that you are a doctor, that you're entitled, that you don't have to listen, and that you did treatment. I wouldn't send my dogs to you, sir. It was not treatment, what you did. It was not medical. There is no medical evidence that was ever brought. Sir, you knew you had a problem. That is clear to me. You knew you had a problem from a very young age, even before you were a doctor. You could have taken yourself away from temptation. But you decided to not address what's inside you that causes this control urge, that causes you to be a sexual predator. Sir, I'm giving you 175 years, which is 2,100 months. <laughs> I just signed your death warrant. I find that you don't get it that you're a danger. You remain a danger. I'm a judge who believes in life and rehabilitation when rehabilitation is possible. I have many defendants come back here and show me the great things they've done in their lives after probation, after parole. I don't find that's possible with you. Uh -huh.